Make your choice, adventurous stranger. Strike the bell and bide the danger. Or wonder, till it drives you mad, what would have happened if you had. Ah! So to me, it was immediately a sign ah! to tell me, <laughs> do the thing. Do the thing. Georgia. It's just about an hour and a half outside of Atlanta. If you know anything about the Georgia Bulldogs, this National is where they live. Georgia yes, Bulldogs. This is where they live. <laughs> and my guest today is Leslie Gordon. Dr. Leslie yes. Gordon. She is a linguist. What is that? Well, if you are a Broadway fan like I am, my favorite musical is My Fair Lady. And so she is the Henry Higgins. <laughs> she is the Hen Henry Higgins of UGA, if you will. But she is reinventing herself at the age of 49. And we're going to find out why and what she's up to. Welcome to We're Not Dead Yet, women rocking their next chapter. Leslie, Hi. thank you for being on my channel. Thank you for coming. I've been looking forward to this. This is exciting. Tell me about your background as a linguist. As a linguist. All right. So I have been into speech sounds particularly for as long as I can remember. I mean, the kid in her room playing with her Barbies that were speaking other languages. That was me. <laughs> Um, earliest memory. And then from there, throughout school, throughout high school, and then more formally in college, studied language acquisition, language teaching. Uh, so I speak other languages, teach other languages. And it sort of branched out from there because linguistics is a huge field. Uh, you know, it's how we relate to each other through language and speech how we learn those languages, what happens when we don't have those languages. It's just, you could go on and on. But my niche has always been about sound and the way that sound cues perception and understanding and that cycle of communication, how, how we make judgments based on sound, how we change ourselves to affect our listeners. It just, it's so rich to me and it's just my happy place. Well, when you were telling me about this on the phone, I could absolutely relate. And I told you a story, if you recall. But for the viewers, I was a young person in, thrown into the world of business in Texas mm -hmm. with a lot of good old boys. Uh -huh. And um, I was very young and had a, acquired you know, responsibility and, and, um, and roles where I had to deal with lots of older people mm -hmm. and I was convinced that I needed to change my tone of voice that I it, it, I needed to deepen my voice this was told to you no or no realization just self oh. self not realization self, self, self um Criticism. Uh, okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, insecurity, yes. if you will. Yes. So I deepened my voice. Mm -hmm. Fast forward decades, uh, I was teaching middle school musical theater mm -hmm. and I was trying to sing again in the choir and I kept getting laryngitis. Mm -hmm. And Nobody could figure out why, and I went to a voice specialist, doctor, and they couldn't find anything wrong with my vocal cords, thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. um, and so, my classical singing voice teacher sent me to a speech therapist okay. to fix what I had messed up yes. <laughs> yes. with my insecurity. And... And I still have to remind myself mm -hmm. to pull my voice out of my throat and use my yes. breath and, yes. you know, let it, let it float and let it be light. Mm -hmm. um, because that's so, you. That's the authentic Apparently you. that's the way that I was built. Yes. <laughs> yes. And There's trying yeah. to change it 
was unhealthy. <laughs> so having been through that experience, I was fascinated by what you do. And of course, for you, you know all the ins and outs and the science of it. <laughs> so tell me about your career path as mm. such. So it's been a windy road. Uh, I finished my doctorate in um, applied linguistics. Again, focusing on language acquisition, sound, teaching, uh, and so And for forth. laymen, like yes. me, what is, what is language acquisition? So how we learn languages. Okay. Um, it could be your native language or subsequent languages. Okay. And because I have always liked other languages, for me it was second language acquisition. Uh, how to teach that effectively, how people learn those, what are the, the factors that contribute to or maybe detract from that experience. And so I was on that path for a while. I was trained to be a researcher. I left with that degree and went right into a teaching research role and probably finally realized, I just I don't want to be writing papers. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. I can do it if I have to, but I really love the teaching. I, I want to take what I know, what the research tells us, and I want to use it to help someone. Yes. In, Sooner, faster, yeah. one on one. Yes, they, they don't need to read the paper. They I just need to sit with them and do it. Uh, and so, as it happened, uh, my career brought me back. That was um, at a private university in Virginia. Came back to UGA to follow another opportunity, which was a great one. But it's it put me in the administrative side of the house, where I was using my knowledge of teaching and pedagogy to shape programs and and help people in a different way, but. It was definitely drifting away from the language. And I was keeping that alive in other ways, still teaching classes when I could, linguistics and Spanish and different things, but that was very much to the side. And so I guess it's been a process that's about, gosh, five or six years now into the making that I've really been re-examining what my gifts are and how I want to use them and paying attention to the times when I am helping someone and feeling that I'm resonating with my gifts and they are benefiting from those gifts and consistently I'm being pointed back to the speech coaching and accent coaching. And I've, we can talk about this too, but I've discovered a whole new wonderful world of um, the, the performance aspect of speech mm -hmm. and accent and not only what it does in that environment and that venue, but how meaningful that is to everyone else's understanding of the power of speech. And so I am redefining and redirecting and creating, reimagining, reimagining, <laughs> re all the things to put myself back in what I believe to be my sweet spot and helping others with what they need through the power of speech. And your original passion. My original passion. <laughs> it never died. It never went anywhere. I just sort of stuck it in the corner for a while. But no limit to where you could go, probably, probably. with that. Uh, you probably. didn't get fired. <laughs> you didn't lose your job. No, more opportunities coming constantly, right. yes. But at 49, you finally said, no, I, this is, I, there's more to life. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, I have, I, I've had the moment internally for a long time, but when I not so long ago voiced it to my husband, who, who has seen me go through this process and and start to re-engineer things, but I finally put it to him in a way that crystallized everything. When I heard it come out of my mouth, <laughs> sound, <laughs> sound again, I said, it it's emotionally and mentally and even physically painful for me not to go there Aww. and do this thing. Aww. I know it. And so, uh, and I've, I'm surrounded by some really powerful friends who are very in touch with purpose and reading the signs and what happens when you align yourself with your purpose. And they've been gently nudging, encouraging, and just gently saying, pay attention. You know, you saw that thing, pay attention. Girlfriends? Yes. Yes. Um, I find a common Yes. in the women that I interview and it's true for me mm -hmm. as well that um, we it's it's women around us giving us the most support and yes. encouragement not yes. that our not that families our, and husbands are not no, but it's just a different form a different of support more objective it is look at it and wow it's powerful I'm so grateful for it I'm and so, so now I'm constantly checking that. myself with them and 
it helps me to check in with myself if I'm checking in with them. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So tell me about this new vision. What is your new venture going to look like? So my coaching business uh, is probably, it probably has several prongs. So I think the first branch of it would be helping others connect to their authentic selves through the power of speech and, and authentic expression. And that means connecting the inner self with the physical components of speech and knowing what that means as a signal to others and helping make that connection and enrich those connections. We have such a powerful built-in toolkit and, and we use it all the time without really thinking about it. My pie in the sky idea is make people think about it. Yeah. Tap into it. There's yeah. so much there. And it's so affected. I think I said this to you on the phone. We are both shaped by our speech, and speech helps us shape ourselves. And so what comes out of us tells others a lot about us, about how we're feeling, where we're from, who we're surrounded with, by and with, uh, if we're um, confident or not. And there, the signals we may not realize um, but when we are helped to realize them the way I help my clients realize them it's really powerful and well we you know pe there are image coaches right yeah but I would think that most of them aren't sound experts <laughs> linguists exactly. linguists exactly. and and that's it's crucial mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously speech is a crucial component yeah we, we exchange thoughts that way feelings that way all the time all day long and that's a great example that you gave because just like an image coach would tell you well would help you find the things that are appropriate for you that make you feel good mm -hmm. rather than saying you always have to wear red or right. you always have to do this or, or that I would be the same way, not prescriptive at all, but to help a client tap into how they feel, what they want to express, help them observe the effects of that, and then make any changes that they might need to make so that they're even more effective. So it's really a guided process of reflection and observation and ultimately execution mm -hmm. that then they take from there yeah. and, and they can make changes on their own later. That's exciting. Yeah. So there's that portion of it and then there's the accent work which has always been a passion as well especially for a lifetime language learner who's learned all the different varieties of this language and, and another language. Um, you, you know our a classic example would be you know a, a, in, in English you have your speakers from the north and your speakers from mm -hmm. the south and all the judgments we like to make about each other. Uh, I'd like to create a judgment-free zone, but again, <laughs> because it's all just variety. We, we layer on the judgments, yes. but it's all just variety. And um, But for there are occasions when, when people are less confident because they have a certain sound, mm -hmm. and they want the ability to... They may come to me and say, I want to change this. I want mm -hmm. to be more this or less that. Mm -hmm. What I would guide them through is a process where they have a fuller inventory at their disposal and they can dial up or dial down as they need per context right? or given a certain audience. Right. And again, it's in their control. I just want to give them the toolkit. And um, so that's really fun. Accents are fun. And we have an actress daughter. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. you and I talked about that is something you're going to explore as yes. well, dialect coaching. Yes, the film industry is film. in the back. Yes, we've got a huge film industry yes. in Georgia. Because it can be very um, anxiety-ridden for a performer to be vulnerable. Accents aren't easy. Uh, we do what we do. We make the shapes that we make in our own native variety of a language because we've developed them over time. Mm -hmm. And then to move quickly into something else and then sell it is is tough, it and, is. and actors know that, and um, many come to the work with anxiety about it, so there's definitely a, a touch that is helpful to them if the coach can guide them through that process with less anxiety. You know, and another honest, uh, practical um, complication of that work is that there's very often little time. Exactly. Uh, especially for auditions exactly. and so forth, and so a coach needs to be able to deliver a sample and a quick breakdown mm -hmm. and get someone up to speed so that at least they can 
be in the ballpark to get the part, and then they find out, you know, they yeah. uh, fine tune it later. Yeah. So it's really layered work. And the more, the higher the level, obviously. At the amateur high school level, they have a much longer rehearsal process. But, you know, you get into um, the very professional shows, and they are putting whole productions on yes. in a matter of weeks. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Fun. Yeah. That'll be exciting. Yeah. So where are you in the process? So I am, um, I've, as I said before, I've done some informal coaching, paid coaching, professional work, but um, just sort of a trickle of it as I've been employed with my other position and as I have the time to take on clients. But now I am officially separating. Uh, that work is done. I'm uh, sliding into my last two weeks. Wow, congratulations. And thank you. And uh, I'm officially putting that shingle out. What is? What do you see as your biggest challenge? What is there anything that... Mm. causes you Anxiety? some trepidation. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I don't have a I don't have a an education in marketing uh -huh. and I've never been really great at tooting my own horn. Selling yourself. I'm selling myself. Because again I've been in a structure you know, in, in academia, you work within a structure and people sort of tell you what the expectations are and you do them and you get a pat on the back and you mm -hmm. go to the next thing. And you don't always have to sell yourself. It's, it's the work <laughs> yes. that's, you know, as, as the evidence. And, and I think that will be true for me, too, in this profession. My work will be my evidence and I'll get referrals and so forth. But to get started, yes. I need to be out there telling people what yes. I do, and it scares me to death. Yes, yes. <laughs> Can't I tell was you there. how many times I record a reel <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. So. That, and and I, I find with women our age in this phase of life, um, we did not grow up with That's an it. iPhone. That's it. We did not grow up, you know, I was a poor child. We didn't mm -hmm. even, video cameras were pretty novel. Oh, yeah. We didn't even yeah, own we one. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even own one. I have no videos of yeah. me as yeah. a child. Yeah. So we, um, I think as a generation, if you will, mm -hmm. find it, not, mo many of us find it not as easy, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. but you'll get there. It's, I'll get there. Just practice. Yeah. Just, you just got to do it. I think so. <laughs> I'll find my my pace and my tone and all of that. I just, like you say, I just have to do it enough that I get comfortable with it. You're I'm a huge like, oh, step ahead of me because when I decided to do this, I said, you know what? I've never been on camera before. I said, what if they hate my voice? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know someone. <laughs> assured on that yeah. level. So, okay, so tell me about this bell. So the bell. So the physical bell that we see. May I? Yes, please. Ooh, that's a beautiful sound too. Sound. Nice. The physical bell as well as what it represents. So it's, there are some layers here. So the physical bell is probably, I'm, I'm estimating here, but I guess it's probably could be nearing 100 years old. Oh my goodness. Um, it was a, it was given to my father by a woman that he worked with when he was early in his career, but she was a retired school teacher working sort of a second phase job. So she's many years older she than was he was. She was herself. reinventing herself. <laughs> she was. And uh, she, she just thought a lot of him and loved his kids and so this was her, from her teaching career, it was her teacher's bell that she would ring to call the kids back to class. I know, right? You're already, so there's already so much love in this bell. Uh, and then when I finished my PhD and I was teaching, mom and dad said, you need this bell. This is appropriate for you. So they gave it to me. It's been sitting on a shelf for a while. Fast forward a few years later, uh, well, several years later, but this has been probably three or four years now. I was already thinking about this shift trying to align the energies and and give myself some courage and up in my environment I think it was on a computer on my computer screen something popped up that shook me to my core 
and it's well since you talked about theater and, and that touches on literature you'll you'll relate to this but it's a poem from a C.S. Lewis I can't remember if it's a novel or if it's a short story it's been a while now since I've looked at it but it's the magician's nephew so if oh, anybody out there sure. knows C.S. Lewis there's a the story is about a couple of children that are on a journey and there's a point where they arrive on a, a point in their path and there's a bell in front of them with a, a hammer or a mallet underneath it. And under the bell is inscribed a poem. It's very short. I'll, I'll tell it to you. Make your choice, adventurous stranger. Strike the bell and bide the danger. Or wonder, till it drives you mad, what would have happened if you had. Ah! So to me, it was immediately a sign ah! to tell me... <laughs> Do the thing. Do the thing. You don't know what it will produce. Because in the story, I think the um, the immediate possible danger was that it would shake the area they were in. I love that poem and that story and the significance of the bell. And I'm going to be stealing that. Please do. Spread it far and wide. I think that is what is holding so many of the women back our age who either have an old passion that they've mm -hmm. always wanted to pursue mm -hmm. or have an idea of something new that they'd like to do um, or maybe don't have any ideas and just they think they're comfortable where they mm -hmm. are but they're not growing and learning right. and expanding and we gravitate um, to what is safe yeah we will often choose what is known and safe over what might be more rewarding yeah so that's that's going to show up on we're not dead yet just ring the bell uh, ring the bell do the thing do it do it do it <laughs> here is to your Thank new you. venture and i'm glad that you you rang the bell